Welcome to Evidence for Faith. It's your host, Michael Lane. So glad you're joining. Today, as we continue in this series we're doing on Keep the Fires Burning, it's it's a study on uh, minor Bible characters, but major lessons that they teach. It's designed for people who are Christians, and it's to help us walk with God. How do we walk close with God? Um, if, if we are in a Christian university or if we're working a lot in church and stuff, it's our life is more like in a bubble. But how do you handle that when you go out? How do we keep our fires burning for God? That's what this series is about. And today, as we're going through this, we're going to be looking at an Old Testament minor character. His name is Baruch. Baruch. Um, some of you probably recognize him. Many of you probably don't. But the question that we're going to learn about this one is, how are you at working for God? That's what we're going to focus on. How are you in working for God? So as we begin this little series here in this lesson um, this morning, I want to uh, explore this character. But in doing so, I want to tell you a story. You see, years ago when I was the head of the science department at a high school, um, our school hired two new teachers. One was just right out of college, and the other one was an, was an experienced teacher who came to us from another school. Both came into our school and both struggled, as many new teachers do when they go to a new school. I've taught in different schools, and the first year at a new school, even after years of experience, is always a little difficult. Now, my job was I was responsible to make sure that they would find their niche at our school and help them in any way that I could. That was my responsibility. Um, now, the new, let's talk about each one of these. The, first of all, the newly hired college graduate had some problems uh, with her teaching, and she was struggling. One night after school, she came into my room in tears, and she said, you know, as I inquired, what's going on? She says, I'm such a terrible teacher, she cried. She said that her lessons were terrible, that she was wondering if she had made a mistake in coming to the school or even if she should have been a teacher. I tried to encourage her and asked her, you know, is there something I could do for her? And she said, well, she told me that the principal informed her that he was coming into her classroom to observe her in a couple of days. And she wasn't ready. She needed some some coaching with her lesson. Um, so I listened to her and I said, why don't you show me your lesson and what you've got planned, how you're going to do this. Now, as she did this, um, she showed me her lesson plan and talked me through it. And I saw many errors in how she was planning to present this lesson. So I asked her if she would like to use one of my old lessons from when I taught this subject. Um, she heartily agreed, yes. And so the next couple of evenings after school, I coached her on teaching this lesson that, yes, I had written the lesson. After a few days, she seemed ready for her observation from the principal. Finally, the day came and the principal went in and observed her. Um, he told her after the class was over that she did a fabulous job. He highly praised her in all aspects from classroom discipline to the fun way she informed the students. And she sat there quietly accepting her the praise. She enjoyed it. Well, it's funny because the next day I had a meeting with the principal about her um, and that lesson that he observed. And he told me that she's doing a great job here. He related how impressed he was with her lesson and the delivery that she had. He told me that um, she seemed like she was probably going to fit in nicely at our school and that, yes, we made a, a good decision in hiring her. Well, I felt relieved. Not long after this, on another day, the new experienced teacher we had hired was facing a similar problem. He was just discouraged about his teaching abilities and he was feeling like a failure. What was worse was that the principal had informed him that he was coming into his room to observe him. So he asked me for help. Uh, so I suggested 
what about using one of my lessons um, on the concept? You're not comfortable with the one you've written and or are planning on doing, which he wasn't, and he didn't know where to go. I said, why don't you use one of mine? So we spent some time um, that day and a couple days after practicing the lesson. Soon he was much more confident. When the day came that the principal observed him, observed him, Everything went absolutely smooth, and he impressed our boss. After the class, the principal met with him and said he was very, very impressed with the lesson and his delivery. But then this teacher admitted to the principal that I had helped him and coached him by using one of my old lessons. The principal looked at him and said, I, I thought so. He said that he could see my hand all over, uh, the influence all over this lesson. But he said, that's fine. He says, there's nothing wrong with that. That's fine. Well, not long after this, the principal and I met to discuss this teacher's performance. And he told me that he was really impressed with him as a teacher. Well, to be honest, I smiled and I sighed a little bit with relief. And then he told me that he knew I had helped him greatly on this lesson. He told me that the teacher even confessed that it was one of my lessons that I had written and that I had coached him totally on how to teach this. Now, I sat there after the principal said this, wondering what my boss uh, was going to think about all this. He told me that, in his opinion, that male teacher we hired, he was really good. He had a very high opinion of him. He says, I, I really, um, he, he, he commented greatly about his honesty in coming forward about where this lesson came from. Not like the other one as much. Um, he says, this person has a lot of honesty and I really like that. And then he just stated that, yeah, I was doing a good job helping our staff fit in here. And I told you that story to tell you this, you know, there's often, often there's a behind the scenes person working who influences others and generally is not recognized. My wife is a classic example of this. She's a behind the scenes type person. Um, she does not like to be in the limelight or on stage or anything like that. She's happy, very, very happy, not even to be noticed or mentioned or anything in front of people. That's, that's her. Um, I've worked in a, a camp in the Northwoods of Wisconsin where we had a, a uh, cook there named Janet that um, would cook phenomenal banquets oh my gosh it like you were dining at a five-star restaurant when she would put on a banquet and stuff and she hid in the kitchen um, we would the director of the camp would try and get her to come out and she just would hide in the kitchen literally i'm not making this up she would hide in the kitchen she did not like to be in in the limelight she was a behind the scenes type person always admired janet for that anyway if you walk down the street and ask people if they've ever heard of a prophet of God named Jeremiah, most people have. And some of them, many of them probably will even uh, be aware that he has a book in the Bible named after him. But ask those same people, the exact same people, if they've ever heard of a man named Baruch. And they will most likely not have a clue to his identity. Oh, some might, but most, as I have done this, most people have never heard of this man. Many people think that you're referring to a movie character, or some have even said, isn't that a fictional person? Uh, it's, it's really interesting. But Baruch did indeed live and was an important biblical character, though we find his name sort of hidden in Scripture. Baruch can be found in only four chapters of the Bible, and they're all in the book of Jeremiah because, well, um, he wrote that book. Yes, Baruch took stylus in hand and wrote the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah dictated what to write, and Baruch, a scribe, wrote it. In fact, his first copy was, was destroyed, and he had to write another, which was even longer than the first edition. The, read the book of Jeremiah. It's all in there. So who is this little-known man who was uh, so close to, um, to this famous writer and famous prophet Jeremiah. Who is this guy, this behind the scenes man? Why did God place him in scripture for us to read about? 
What major lesson can we learn from uh, such a seemingly insignificant fellow in our walk with God? Well, we first find Baruch in Jeremiah chapter 32, obtaining a deed for property that Jeremiah had just bought. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 12, I'm going to read this out of the King James Version. It reads, I gave the evidence of the purchase unto Baruch, the son of Neriah, and in the presence of the witnesses that subscribed the book of the purchase before all the Jews that sat in the court of the prison. Now, what's going on here? Baruch is being introduced, basically, in this sentence here, he's an errand boy for Jeremiah. And that's what we see. He's just acting as an errand person, an errand boy, messenger. Now, the next time we find Baruch in Scripture, it's in Jeremiah chapter 36. I'm going to read this, uh, the first, or verses 4 through 8, on the English Standard Version. And it reads, Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah. And Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of the Lord that he had spoken to him. And Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, I am banned from going to the house of the Lord, so you are to go. And on a day of fasting, in the hearing of all the people of the, in the Lord's house, you shall read the words of the Lord from the scroll that you have written at my dictation. And you shall read them also in the hearing of all men of Judah who come out of their cities. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before the Lord, and that everyone will turn from his evil way, for great is the anger and wrath that the Lord has pronounced against his people. And Baruch, the son of Neriah, did all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll and the words of the Lord um, in the Lord's house. You see, Baruch is assigned an important task to write down what Jeremiah had written and read it orally in the temple. Now, this was not going to be one of those happy Disney-type pieces of entertainment. No, this is of terror and destruction that is about to happen to Jerusalem and all of them living there because of their flaunting God's laws. So many people heard the word of God coming from Baruch's lips, not from Jeremiah. Later, he is ushered in front of the palace officials and was asked to read it again in front of them. This is in the same chapter, 36 of the book of Jeremiah, verses 14 and 15. It reads, Then all the officials sent Jehudai, the son of Nethani, son of Shem, uh, Shalami, son of Cushi, to say to Baruch, Take in your hand a scroll that you read in the hearing of the people, and come. So Baruch, the son of Nerai, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And he said to them, Sit down and read it. So Baruch read it to them. So after this reading, he was told by officials to go to Jeremiah, and that both of them should go into hiding, because the king was not going to like this message. We see this in Jeremiah 36, 19. Then the officials said to Baruch, go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. And these officials were absolutely right in telling them to hide because G, uh, the king, uh, Jehoiakim of Judah, did not appreciate the message from God. Look at, look at what he does as an official named uh, Jehudai, is reading the scroll to him. Now get this, this is in verse 23 of the same chapter, chapter 36. As Jehudai read three or four columns, the king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. After the scroll was burned, Jeremiah then dictates another one to Baruch. Both men are undaunted by this blatant destruction of God's holy word. This shows us the character of these two. They were both totally dedicated to God and did not fear a human king, but they did fear an awesome God. Hmm, there's a lesson we can learn, eh? Well, the next mentioning of Baruch comes in Jeremiah chapter 43. Here, he is being blamed for inciting Jeremiah against 
uh, a bunch of arrogant idiots. Um, he's being picked on and lied about by these leaders. And this is in Jeremiah chapter 43, the first three verses, and it reads, When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people these words of the Lord their God, and with uh, which the Lord their God had sent to them, Azariah, the son of Hoshaiah, and Joanan, the son of Kariah, and all the insolent men said to Jeremiah, You are telling a lie. The Lord our God did not send you to say, do not go to Egypt to live there. But Baruch, the son of Neri, has set you against us to deliver us into the hands of the Chaldeans so that they may kill us or or take us into exile in Babylon. Hmm. Yeah, he's being blamed. Now, we have one more occasion when Baruch is mentioned in in Scripture. This is in chapter 45. Now, this is a short chapter in this book, and it's basically dedicated just to Baruch. So I'm going to read Jeremiah 45, 1 through 5, and then we're going to see a little bit more into the character of this guy. Listen to what is written in verses 1 through 5 of Jeremiah 45. The word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neri, when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah, in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, Woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with my groaning, and I find no rest. Thus shall you say to him, Thus says the Lord. Behold, what I have built, I am breaking down. What I have planted, I am plucking up. That is the whole land. And do not seek great things for yourself. Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. Now, what's happened here? God is making a warning and a promise to Baruch. He tells him, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not? Mm, That's a rebuke. And what a rebuke coming from God. This is a man who has been in the shadow. Now, get this. In the shadow of one of the greatest prophets of all time. He's been a close friend. He's been an assistant to Jeremiah. But God specifically warns him here not to seek great things for himself. So was Baruch starting to get a bit jealous of Jeremiah? And of all the fame and recognition that Jeremiah has? It appears maybe so. Maybe that's why God placed this short little chapter in this book to be a rebuke on any of us that seeks greater things for ourselves. So how are you at working for God? Baruch was a servant of God, worked under Jeremiah. How are you at working for God? Do you get a little annoyed when someone else you work with seems to get all the praise? Do you feel that you're being overlooked, even though you're working just as hard, if not harder, than others who are getting the credit and promotions? Are you, uh, how are you at, at being in the, shall we say, the shadow of someone else? Can you live with being in the shadow of someone greater and still rejoice that they are getting the acknowledgments? If you ever felt like that, and I'm sure Baruch Baruch did too, and I have too, um, we, we do feel like this at times. And Baruch was given a special message from God all about this. And remember, Baruch was the one who was writing all this down for Jeremiah. So that alone must have been very difficult for him. But God also gave him a special gift. He said that he will give him his life as a prize. So what can we learn? I think that there are some great faith lessons for us from the life of Baruch in these little passages here. Um, For one, he was a faithful friend to Jeremiah. Even when Jeremiah was not popular with anybody else, Baruch stuck with him. He didn't desert Jeremiah when things got tough. He was courageous enough to place his life on the line to read every very unpopular message from God 
in front of the multitudes and the high officials. He was attacked. He was blamed. He was lied about because of his friendship to Jeremiah. He was willing to play the second fiddle to a famous person to get the word of God proclaimed to the people. He was honest, and he proclaimed that he was just a scribe and not the author of the scroll. He admits it. I mean, he could have claimed all the the book of Jeremiah basically is his own, but he does not do that. He gives it to Jeremiah. He's honest is what we get out of this. Now, we too realize that God is to be honored. I mean, Christians, let's face it, God is supposed to be honored. We know all that deep down, not us. God is to get the glory, not us. God is to be praised, not us. God is the author of anything good, coming from our lives. It is not us. We're just tools in the hands of a master. Baruch understood what humility was all about. Do you? I remember my dad, who's long, long ago went home to be with the Lord. He loved to make things. Um, woodwork, he could work with metal, he worked with wood. He he just loved to build things. And people, he would sell them sometimes at flea markets and stuff. Um, or even for people, people would ask him to build something and he would do it. And he would do a very good job. Um, he was very skilled at stuff like that. <laughs> not, <laughs> that is something that was not genetic. I did not get that gene. But anyway, um, I remember hearing people come up at one point and talking to my dad and something dawned on me. They came up and they were talking about, they were looking at this rocking chair he made and this entertainment center that he made and some other little knickknack um, things for kitchens and shelves and stuff that he made. And they were all commenting, these people were about how, how cool these were, how beautiful they were, um, the mastery behind that. And my dad was receiving praise for it. But you know something, as I was, um, listening to all this, I realized, and it just came up in my mind that my dad used all these tools, you know, screwdrivers, a drill, a saw, and other things, a wood lathe. He had all that. No one ever praised him or praised the wood lathe. No, ever, no one ever went up and said, wow, what a great wood lathe that it made those legs like that. Wow, what a great saw that it cut this wood like that. No, those were just tools in a master's hands. We, Christians, are just tools in the master's hands. You see, when a, a person becomes a Christian, Jesus determines what spiritual gift he will give a person, and then the Holy Spirit delivers it to them. All Christians have at least one spiritual gift. And there is not one gift that is more important than another, though to the flesh of the human flesh, nature, a sinful nature, it, we sometimes make it think, we start to think that one gift is better than the other, but it's not like that. Paul writes a lot about this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Take a moment and read that sometimes and see how all the different parts make up the body, um, the different parts of the body, the ear, the eye, the hand, the foot, the leg, everything has a purpose, a lung, a liver. You can't say that one part is more important than the other. They all work together. And when it's not working all together, you know what we call that? Handicapped. If you're not doing your part for God, you're handicapping the church. Hmm. William Barclay, in his commentary, The Gospel of Luke, he records an interesting lesson that I want to share with you in closure. It's about a person. His name is Principal Karens. That's all I really know about him outside of what's in this story. Uh, William Barclay writes, the humility of Principal Karens was phenomenal. He was so well known in the educational world. He would never enter a room first. He would always step back and say, no, you, here, go on, I'll follow. Though he was so well known and respected by the public. On one occasion, as he stepped up to climb the steps to one of the seats on a platform in front of the audience, the public noticed who he was and immediately burst into applause. 
Principal Karens was shocked. He turned and looked and and stepped back and had the man behind him go ahead of him. And then he applauded the man who had just walked up from behind him, thinking the applause was for him. You see, that's not phony humility. That's true humility. It never dawned on Principal Karens that the public was applauding him. There's a great lesson there for us. How are you working with your gifts for God? Lord, I thank you for this lesson that we have here and this character, Baruch. Fascinating person. Fascinating lesson that you've given us about how we should be. As we have gifts that we're supposed to work in the church, some of us will be out on on stage and in front and, and in the limelight. Others, Lord, we're behind and we're supposed to be there. And if we don't carry on our, our gifts, if we don't use them for you, we, we handicap your church. Help us, Lord, not to do that. And help us also not to get so puffed up about the gift that we've got as opposed to what someone else has given by you. We're all important. Help us to realize that and help us not to be ashamed or embarrassed or whatever, to let others behind us get the applause. So help us to grow like that, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining me today on this lesson of Baruch, and hope you know him a little bit better now. But more importantly, I hope we can all learn from him as his example. So until we meet again, Take care and may God bless. Thanks for tuning in and thank you to our donors who make this program possible. Evidence for Faith is a 501c3 nonprofit ministry based in the USA. You can support this broadcast by donating online using the links in the description. And don't forget to leave us a comment, a review, likes and shares to feed the algorithm and help others find this content. Thanks again and we'll see you on the next episode.